Hey, good afternoon, and thank you all for joining me again for another Pour Over History. My name is Joe Rizzo. I am the director of the Loudoun Museum, and this is kind of a second part to our first Pour Over History that had Jared Frederick talking about D-Day and some soldiers' experiences for that. Uh, for this version of it, I want to stick with the topic of World War II, but particularly put a Loudoun County focus on that. Uh, so to do so, I've got Richard Gillespie, a historian and local history expert for Loudoun County, uh, to join me here to answer a, a few questions of mine about uh, World War II, but specifically about the Loudoun experience. So Richard, thanks for joining us uh, for this short conversation here over coffee. Pleasure. Uh, we're, we're drinking chock full of nuts, the heavenly coffee. Nice. Yeah, I've got my, my Buffalo Bills mug. Kevin Pollock would be proud of that. Um, but I'm drinking King Street. <laughs> and I'm very happy that they're still open and in a safe manner. Uh, so very appreciative that uh, King Street and Leesburg is uh, still up and running for coffee and then also uh, for coffee beans to go. Serving Loudoun History Museum directors for many, many years. Uh, <laughs> actually, I, I guess they're not as old as that, but uh, we've always been very attached to our local merchants. Absolutely. Good, good partners. Absolutely. Well, this is it's an interesting topic, uh, talking about Loudoun and World War II. Um, I was fascinated by World War II as a kid because my dad was a veteran and he was in the Pacific and he would talk about it some. I talked about it a lot more in the last years of his, his life before he, he passed back in 2010. But uh, of course, wherever I've gone, I've wanted to ask questions. And what was your experience like? My grandparents used to love to sit around at long breakfasts and long suppers in the summer uh, on the coast of Maine at their cottage and spin stories. And I heard stories of U-boats just off the coast and German saboteurs being let off and people trying to drive cars with shaded headlights and all kinds of things like that. So my curiosity was, was piqued. And indeed, my first real book that I read was about a kamikaze pilot who, uh, who, who wrote his memoir, which of course doesn't make a whole lot of sense if you think about it. But... <laughs> I was pretty peaked when I was eight. I thought that was a cool story. So in Loudoun County, um, we have a county that is surprisingly much the same as it has been for many, many years before World War II. Um, we are an overwhelmingly agricultural county in 1940-41 as World War II is getting cooking over there. Um, indeed. Um, the major changes that have come to Loudoun County that you would expect to find are changes brought by the Great Depression. Um, the county is reasonably poor, although we have some of the best agricultural land in the state. We have a population of about 21,000, which is about what we'd had at the outbreak of the Civil War. Most of the people, as I say, are farmers, and if they're not, then they live in railroad communities. There are little villages all up the railroad line. There's Sterling and Ashburn, both extremely tiny. There's Leesburg, which is the county seat with 1,500 people, about the same as it was 80 years before Civil War period. Um, and then you come over the mountain and there's Peonian Springs and Hamilton, which is one of the bigger Western Latin towns, and then Purcellville and Round Hill and Bluemont. Uh, train service in 1939 ends at Round Hill. Kind of takes Bluemont on our Western end of the slope of the Blue Ridge out of the equation. And by 1941, even passenger service all along the line has been stopped. So the old commuter business that we would have known during World War I and throughout the 20s has gradually been run out by the Depression and also by the advent of the automobile. In the 1930s, one big change in 1932, 33, 34, they built Route 7, the Harry F. Bird Highway, so called that, that uh, connects all of these communities as well. And uh, in 1939, they were with using federal money, the Works Progress Administration was building a new US 15, which replaced the old Carolina Road as the major north south and straightened it out. Uh, so the US 15 we take today that comes straight down through the middle of Leesburg 
King Street and then head south to just uh, east of Aldi at Gilbert's Corner and so forth. That whole road is a 1939 federal project, US 15. So that's making a bit of a difference. Hardly anybody in Loudoun commutes at that point. Um, the only commuters we have are weekend horsey set people who come out to Middleburg. Um, some fairly famous people who come out here in the 30s. George S. Patton had come out here. Billy Mitchell had come out here. Uh, and some fairly wealthy folks had come out here. Uh, so we knew about that scene. Uh, the rest of us were doing what we'd always done, which is to grow grain, raise cattle, uh, huge milking industry, dairy industry, and then the towns that supported those kinds of things. Yeah, and Richard, um, you mentioned how do we the feel? Depression. Yeah. You mentioned the Great Depression. That's one thing I was actually going to ask you. So I don't think you can really view a community's experience during World War II without understanding its relationship with the Great Depression. With Loudoun being primarily agricultural, was the county, in, from what you know, hit harder or maybe more immune from the Depression because it was still producing agriculturally? Um, good question. Um, I would tell you that the Depression hit Loudoun in 1921. Uh, that's when the bottom dropped out. Uh, we'd been producing hugely during World War I. Uh, the U.S. Farm Credit Administration extended a lot of credit for people to put more acres into production. And then all that fell out when Europe came back online in 1921. So really eight years before the Great Depression begins in, in 2930, our farmers here are really feeling the brunt of this. And accordingly, all the merchants that work with them are feeling the brunt as well. Um, the Great Depression, in, in, in the many interviews I've had with people, most people have to think hard to think, oh, yeah, I got to translate that into uh, when the Depression was for us versus when the Depression was for everybody else. They barely felt the difference unless they had stocks. Some of the merchants, the middle class in Leesburg or Percival might have felt that. Um, but uh, for most people, things were pretty tough. Uh, teacher salaries dropped throughout that era. Uh, I was talking to several teachers the other day because of the coronavirus and asking them, do they expect to get laid off? And they're saying, well, we hope not. But then as one of them commented, well, during the Great Depression, we're just glad to keep your job. And so if you see in 1936 school year, we're going to be lowering your salary. You're saying, well, prices are finally falling. We have deflation. I have a job. Many of the people I know do not. Um, Loudon started to drop back into the depression in 38-39. So until massive wartime spending begins with Germany's in, invasion of France, Belgium, and Holland in, in mid-May 1940, and suddenly the United States gets very, very scared and starts to appropriate defense money and the draft begins, those two things in September uh, of, of 1940, you don't see our economy begin to pick up at all. So if you came here in 39 or 40, despite the federal highway being built, yeah, we were depression ridden, absolutely. Yeah, and I always get you know, fascinated too, because we know when you think civilians during war, I think people first think of Loudoun during the Civil War or during the Revolutionary War, but you know, communities change during wars if they're foreign wars as well. Obviously the wars aren't taking place within the community, but those communities are still extremely impacted by it, whether from the soldiers who are going overseas, uh, to potentially to though to production. So was that agricultural production that Loudoun was known for, did that play a, a, a role in the war effort at all? Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, it did. Uh, production in, in Loudoun was suddenly crucial, uh, grain uh, and beef in particular. Um, and the question of course was, is the draft going to take our labor force and for a while, the draft laid off uh, young men who were farmers. But then by 1944, the needs were so huge as we get ready for things like the invasion of Europe and the island hopping in the Pacific. Then they begin to call up uh, boys from small farms. Uh, so if you weren't producing at least a certain amount, then you became eligible, which means a lot of Loudoun boys are going to go in 1944 and 45, as opposed to earlier. Before that, it was the town kids that were going to go. Um, one thing to notice in, in World War II, as in World War I, 
uh, we always talk about people signing up. I'm going to enlist in this, that, and the other. The government was asking you not to, in general, to sign up with uh, Selective Service, but then to wait until you were called. One fellow I got to know pretty well, it was the son of the owner of the local hardware store in Percival, Milton Nichols. He spoke about graduating from high school in the spring of 1942 and then not being called up, though he was 18. So he went and worked in Baltimore uh, at an aircraft plant, Glenn Martin. Uh, that was making the making B-26s, maybe, Martin Marauder. Uh, but that's what he was doing. And then finally they called him up, so he came home, went in. Um, but he was a townie. Uh, whereas if I'm a farm kid, I'm going to be busting my chops by 1941 with the invasion of Europe. Uh, France, a lot of their growing regions are offline uh, with the German invasion. And uh, so the the other problem we're going to see, besides the shortage of labor, is a shortage of machinery. We didn't have the money during the Depression to be buying the new tractors. They were out there, um, but uh, a lot of Loudoners are still using plow horses. We're still very famous for our horses, more, you know, uh, event and, and fox hunting and that kind of a thing, but a lot of them were plow horses. So you're going to see... Uh, really a 19th century system having to meet a mid 20th century demand. Right. Um, so that's going to be big. The other quite thing that uh, I'd point out to you is pretty well known story in Loudoun is that Western Loudoun in particular uh, had gotten into growing what locals call Johnson grass, but better known as orchard grass and orchard grass was good covering to keep erosion down. You can imagine that, during the many projects of the 1930s, the WPA and others were doing that there was great need for that. But the big use for it came during World War II because uh, they used it in ammunition crates, not the grass, the seed, because the seed was very heavy. And if you pack seed around shells or cartridges for small arms, they wouldn't move much in the box. And then when you get it over there, all that orchard grass seed could be used uh, by British farmers. Um, so we had a double use and we became Loudoun County, one of 17 Virginia counties producing, and we became the biggest of the producers of this crucial orchard grass during the war. Yeah, and so, yeah that was a big that, thing for us. You know, in ways in which you probably never think about, you know, with the war effort and all the factors that go into, you know, such a massive outpouring of need, like during yeah. the societal mobilization of war. Yeah, absolutely. Um, of course, as, as people get called up, um, there's real pressure on marriages. Uh, do you get married before you go? Uh, my dad, although not a Loudner, might be a pretty good example of what Loudners were doing. And that's saying, well, you're going to go off for basic. You know, if you're Army, you may go to Fort Dix or wherever you get sent or Navy Great Lakes Training Center, whatever. Uh, maybe then you come home on your less than a week leave, get married, not a, a huge thing, might even be in the living room or at the local church and have a few days for a honeymoon. And then he gets shipped out. Of course, if that's going on, um, you, you might think that a lot of the young women who are, you know, they're, this is a very with it generation. They're not unlike kids today. They're thinking, well, what am I going to do here? I could stay home and knit and roll bandages for the Red Cross. I can help mom with the victory garden. I, I can do a job that's been left by a guy. I mean, if I go up the gas station, they'll surely hire me if I'm not a nitwit uh, to pump gas and to check their ration coupons to make sure that I'm giving out four gallons to all those with the A coupons and eight gallons to those with the Bs that have a bigger need for gas. Uh, that would be a good job. But a lot of girls are going to be called uh, to service, I think. They'll see the ads in the local papers. Um, I was looking um, at one that I thought was uh, particularly good that I liked. Um, and and uh, this kind of speaks to me. This is February 10th, 1944. It was in the Loud News, one of our several papers at the time. It says, can you drive a car? When you were a kid, did you always pester to go along in every ride? And now do you get a kick out of handling the wheel like a man? Women with mechanical ability are needed 
in the Women's Army Corps at once. Other skills are needed too, and untrained women can learn skills that will be useful all their lives. 239 types of Army jobs need wax to fill them. And of course, there was the Women's Army Corps, and there was there were the waves for the Navy. And it was interesting listening to uh, Her Majesty yesterday uh, give her speech, and she was referencing World War II, where she did exactly the kind of a job that that ad references, but for the Royal Army instead of the U.S. Army. Um, it is interesting how many young men come home with a girl they've met elsewhere. And when I first moved to Loudoun County in the mid-70s, uh, I said, boy, a lot of Loudoun County people have this really thick southern accent. Over time, I've gradually refined what a native Loudoun County accent is, and it's more of a regional accent. But the thick southern accent, a lot of these girls that were met by guys off of training at southern bases, met a girl, got married, then got shipped out and brought her back home to Loudoun County to be a farm girl or whatever, maybe live in town and help a merchant as his wife. Yeah, I guess that's a good example to show that, you know, war can affect, you know, communities in very different ways, not necessarily what the community is doing for the war, but maybe how the war then comes back to the community. Uh, not yeah. with, just in terms of death toll or wounded, but in ways you probably might not think of. Yeah, I, I think one of the questions that I wondered about, and and I think I'll, I'll address that, is that um, if you look at communities that are near big cities, say Washington, uh, during and after World War II, don't you expect a, a massive explosion of, I guess we'll call it suburbia. And realistically, that did happen. If you are in parts of Fairfax, uh, close to Alexandria and Arlington, or if you're in Alexandria or Arlington, huge growth of suburbia did not touch Loudoun County. Not in the 40s, not in the 50s. Our first subdivision doesn't come until 1959. Um, and that's uh, Broad Run Farms down at 28 and 7. Still there. Um, and uh, they, they built it, keeping a lot of trees and spreading the houses out a great deal, unlike today, because people wanted to still have the rural feel. But this is a long way out from the city. Uh, well, during World War II, they did uh, put back in uh, train service. He even bought a special uh, train car, General Electric. This is an electric car, I think it is. Uh, there's also a diesel. Actually, this is a photo with a diesel. This is at Leesburg's train station. And that, would that, uh, that, now, that is today? I'm sorry? That's the WNOD right through Leesburg? That's the WNOD, and that station is now Fireworks Pizza, part of Market Station moved uh, a block or two to over there. Uh, but then, you know, that commuter line kept until 1951. And yet we didn't have very many Loudoners who were uh, doing anything um, about commuting at that particular time. So the commuting is really a later phenomenon. And then, of course, Sterling, the sort of Levitt town south, uh, uh, doesn't come until 1962. You think that lack of suburban sprawl, which is you know happening when people are coming back home and there's more prosperity and consumerism, do you think it's because of the agricultural need of the county, or was it more just a lifestyle resistance in terms of Loudoners wanting to move to more of a suburban uh, complex? Ooh, there were Loudoners who left and and became part of Northern Virginia, or or the Baltimore sprawl, for sure. We, we lost a bit of population, gained a bit of population. Um, it's a very distinctive lifestyle. And if, if you become used to it, it would be hard to adapt to something else. I mean, typically, if, if you were in Round Hill or Percival or Leesburg, you had a six day work week. And then Saturday night, you went to town. If you lived in town, you sat on your porch, or if you didn't live in the main street of town or one of the biggest of the cross streets, then you went to somebody else's porch and sat, or you drove your car to town and you sat in the back seat in the front seat and visited with others and people played musical cars. Um, and uh, it was a theater in, in both Percival and, uh, and 
Leesburg. And so you shuffle the kids off to watch the movies, uh, segregated uh, African-American kids in the balcony, dropping popcorn on the white kids on the first floor. Um, but uh, that lifestyle you were used to. Uh, you were used to going to the swimming hole. You were used to riding a horse. Uh, you were used to going for a Sunday afternoon drive. Um, and suddenly to go to suburbia would be huge. Uh, but then remember that a lot of our guys that are called up are going to see these new suburban places. And in particular, um, New Jersey. Um, they're going to see uh, California. They'll see parts of the behemoth that becomes Texas um, and Florida. And they'll see these new modernistic, flatter roofed yeah. ranch houses yeah. and their old Victorian uh, vernacular farmhouses seem awfully dated and not very excited. And they're beginning to see uh, another option. So I'm sure some Loudoners were tantalized and, and were happy to move on. That's a good point, too. I mean, I think maybe the thought is you sign up for war and then you go off to Europe, but they're going to bases for training for significant periods of time before they ever make it over to Europe. So they're not just experiencing France or other places that they're going through, or potentially Northern Africa, depending on uh, what phase of the war they're in, but also, yeah, other parts yeah. of the world bases uh, for basic training to learn how to be a soldier before going, going off across yeah. the, or the Pacific, really. Yeah. Uh, so what else, you know, is anything else that stands out to you maybe about Loudoun County during World War II or about uh, particular any soldiers or any stories that uh, stand out to you? A few. Uh, there's a question that always comes up is, is it true that we had prisoners of war, POWs in Loudoun? Oh, good point. Um, by the last few years of the war, particularly after the German army uh, collapsed, in, in May 1943 uh, on the North African front. Uh, lots of prisoners, over 300,000 prisoners are going to come stateside. And uh, with a shortage of farmers, as we're beginning to call up uh, farm boys from the smaller farms in 1944-45, there becomes a program where prisoners that seem less dangerous are going to be sent out to camps. It was a big camp at Winchester and then satellite camps uh, that might be 150 to 200 prisoners. And then these prisoners, if they showed that they were trusty, um, were brought out on trucks to work on farms. Um, and usually the farm wife would feed them. And oftentimes the families, initially a little uncomfortable, are going to find that a lot of the boys who come are very well educated, that they speak uh, some sort of English, some of them had visited the states during the 20s or 30s. Um, and uh, they realized that not everybody was a Nazi. Um, and so relationships actually built in some cases between these farm families and these prisoners that would work on the farms. The Loudoun base, about 190 prisoners at peak. Um, if you head south on Route 15 and then right on Harmony Church Road, Route 704, it was just a very short way up 704 on the left uh, on the south side of Harmony Church Road. Um, and then they would go out to farms, particularly her uh, farms in the Leesburg, Waterford, Peonian Springs, Hamilton area speak of it, that they use them a good bit. So that's not atypical, but it's one of the stories that Loudoners remember. One of the stories that comes up is right at the beginning of the war, this panic. And it reminds me so much of the beginning of the Civil War. What's the first thing Loudon begins to worry about when the Civil War comes in 1861? Guarding the bridges. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what we did in 1941 in December. Armed guards up on the Point of Rocks Bridge, uh, armed guards at the Berlin Bridge, and armed guards at, at the bridge that went over into Harpers Ferry. And particularly the Point of Rocks Bridge, since this new US-15 was considered a major highway, that was something that they worried about a lot. As with everywhere else, we had air raids. Uh, we had an air raid in the first week after Pearl Harbor. Uh, everybody immediately, frantically trying to get blackout curtains, just as we're trying to get these mouth uh, protective gear right now during COVID-19. 
um, and people having all kinds of ideas of what you can do to keep things blacked out. High school kids and kids uh, that, that had homework are frantically trying to figure out if we have a blackout during an air raid, which was usually the tests were an hour long, how on earth are we going to do our homework? You know, most kids didn't care, but there were always those kids that were the really diligent students that worried about this. And they eventually figured out super ways to cover the windows so that they could still have a one light on in the house and that I'll be studying under it. Um, but uh, the other thing, of course, you hear about is Mount Weather. And I know uh, our colleagues, uh, Jennifer Moore, at Mosby Heritage Area and Nathan Stalvey over the mountain at Clark County Historical Association just did a nice little piece on a Cold War bunker. Um, Mount Weather had been a weather station. At one point, uh, it was considered by President Coolidge as a sort of a summer or weekend White House. And even uh, Hoover uh, considered it briefly before getting a cabin down in Shenandoah National Park. And then Roosevelt thought about it before he built Shangri-La up in Catoctin Mountain Park, uh, north of Frederick, which is, is uh, Camp David today. So it stayed on as a weather station. But during World War II, all kinds of rumors uh, began to circulate. And a gray bus would come down and pick workers up were all sworn to secrecy. And they were going up there to work. And nobody quite knew why. Uh, today, the stories vary. One of the stories at the time was uh, that they were testing out drill bits and therefore doing some boring on some particularly hard rock that the Blue Ridge had. And so these were tests, but then as uh, nobody particularly noticed too much coming out of there and they kept boring and drilling and whatever, nobody quite knew what was going on. Uh, today, uh, one of the thoughts is that if you were one of those who was a conscientious objector or had been arrested for failure to do service. Uh, you were in an armed camp up there. Um, and some of the people being taken up were part of the guarding system. But we know also that some of the stories about the drill bits were true and that they were really beginning uh, to build some sort of an underground cavity uh, under the Blue Ridge uh, between Loud and Clark. Uh, under U.S. Uh, State Route 601. Um, and eventually that became the place where the president was supposed to go come the time of the Cold War. During the Cuban Missile Crisis, of course, everybody here was abuzz in 1962 about was it completed? Was it built? Could Congress go there? How much of a hole had they built? And the stories have continued and loud ever since. I remember a student telling me uh, that from her house, she could see helicopters fly right into the mountain and disappear. Because as you looked at the mountain, if one of the doors, electric doors opened and this huge hole came and a helicopter could fly in it, you'd just see the copter would be eaten by the mountain and you didn't know quite what was going on. So the beginning of all of those stories uh, really began during World War II. What exactly is there? Uh, different people say they've seen it, but they won't tell. So that story kept loud and a buzz through, oh, 1943, 44, 45 anyway, and for years after the war. Uh, those are a, a, a few of the ones that strike me. I thought I'd show you a picture. Yeah, please uh, do. One of our favorite, um, let's see if we can get this up. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Um, that is one of the last cars sold in Loudoun County. 1942 Buick Special. Uh, fast back. And when we stopped making cars uh, in January 1942, um, we uh, were without cars. And so you used your old car. In 1942, late 41, some people were just getting the money to begin to think about a new car and probably were putting it off. And then suddenly it was too late. Um, and uh, wish that they had. So there'll be a huge demand at the end of the war for cars. Of course, we're resting gas as everywhere else is, not only because tankers going from the Houston ship channel uh, through the Gulf around Florida and up the East Coast are being torpedoed right off the coast of Virginia. 
in, in the spring and summer of 1942, but also because the Philippines are a big source of rubber falls. So we have a drastic shortage of rubber for tires. It became very hard in Loudoun to get any tires for cars. Retreads, of course, became the thing, which we don't use much anymore, at least on automobiles. Uh, most of the rubber was going to have to go for farm vehicles um, and, and crucial vehicles for the war effort. So uh, those who were involved in that uh, were the ones who were going to get the tires. When a handful of tires would come out, everybody wanted them. So in a farm <laughs> community, things like that could really kind of get you. It was kind of weird that you were producing food and victory gardens and crops in the field, and yet we had shortage of wheat and we had a shortage of, of all kinds of other foodstuffs. So you get used to eating a lot uh, more frugally. And yet in Loudoun County, many people pointed out, yeah, well, we were already doing that. Uh, we were already pretty well feeding ourselves after 1921. So it wasn't that much of a, of a change. Um, those are some of the things that strike me uh, in, in particular. Uh, I imagine that you gather that like everywhere else, Lots of Loudoners went to aircraft spotting shacks and uh, every plane that flew over, uh, they looked at and then identified its silhouette in a chart they had and then phoned it in Leesburg, who phoned it in uh, to closer to the city. That was going on all over the country. You'd think we're inland enough, we wouldn't be quite so worried about that. But there was a huge thought that the Germans were indeed capable of aircraft carriers or transatlantic flight from uh, North Africa. Um, and of course, we were capable of transatlantic flight. Uh, we, you know, we were sending our bombers over there that way. Uh, you would fly from here to South America to Africa and up to Europe. But we were afraid that the Germans were ahead of us, and so that they might actually be able to do an air raid and do sort of like uh, a Jimmy Doolittle did flying over Tokyo, and nobody thought he could that they'd do that to us. But, of course, it never came about, but people got quite used to it. When I first moved to Percival in 1975, uh, I was thrilled to hear that the siren on top of the local pharmacy was the same siren that had been installed during World War II. So it was a World War II air raid siren. And it sounded pretty much like the fire sirens that we had for a number of years in the 80s. And then they shifted them in the 90s and, and 21st centuries. So they're a little different today. But... Uh, most Loudoners of a certain age are all quite used to hearing that kind of a siren whenever any of the fire companies have a fire. And most of those have been shut down lately. Yeah. Well, Rich, this has been great. I mean, I've learned a lot just, you know, from these few minutes here, hearing some of these stories, uh, things I wasn't even aware of. Uh, much appreciated you for joining us, and I would love to do this again soon. We're going to be doing all sorts of topics uh, each week, uh, kind of with this series, but I'd love to bring you back and uh, hear some more stories and you know get more of your reflections on Loudon and uh, various parts of its history. Nice talking with you, Joe. Enjoyed it. I think our coffee is a little colder now, but uh, yeah, here's to you. Go, uh, let's do it again. Sounds good. Thank you, Rich. Okay. Take care.